to unleash your inner Goldilocks, how to get it just right. Thank you so much for joining us on another exciting and insightful episode. And we are going to be having a very, very culturally and socially important conversation on healthcare. And I cannot wait for everybody to engage and get to know our special guest today. As we get started, as always, let us take a moment and think about why Goldilocks, why are we a Goldilocks community, and what is Goldilocks teaching us? To me, Goldilocks embodies something very special that we all have inherently. When we were young children, even if we don't remember our childhood, think about your own children, think about your nephews and nieces. Think about how even before a child knows to speak, they know how to influence the adults around them and get exactly what they want when they want. This is a skill, a art, a capability we are born with. Somewhere along the way, we forget. We forget we get conditioned and then we get set in our ways and we tend to become my way or the highway. But what if we took a step back and looked at various perspectives of any situation and came at it from that centeredness, all of a sudden, every dream I have, every goal I have is accomplishable because I see perspective from other people's vantage point and I can influence them and bring them to the table to actually get the issue at hand result. So the Goldilocks is giving us a blueprint for shared prosperity and driving our influence. Research shows that we can all influence only three levels, just three levels from where we are. So if we come from an extreme right end of a situation, we can only influence three levels towards the center. If we come from the extreme left end, we can only influence three levels towards the center, towards the center being the operative word. Now, what if we took perspective and came from that centeredness of slightly left or right, and we see how a particular situation can impact different people, and therefore we come with empathy and kindness and our human capabilities, all of a sudden, I have the ability to influence three levels to my right, three levels to my left, and everybody else in my centered perspective taking. And I have magnified my influence to seven. That is where the power of leadership is. Leadership is nothing but the power of influence. And how are we each going to exert our power of influence to live our purpose and build shared prosperity? because whether we realize it or not, the lives we sustain ultimately will always be our own. What is purpose, you may ask? Purpose itself sits in the intersection of three elements, what you love, what you're great at, and what the world needs. If I love something and I know the world needs it, but I totally suck at it, I'm not going to be the person who truly brings that to the world and benefits in driving the economic engine and financial prosperity for myself because somebody else is going to do that better. If I'm great at something and the world needs it, but I don't love it, it's going to show that my heart is not in it and therefore it is not going to make those who are engaged with me be a part of a team, be a part of a process. So purpose itself sits in the centeredness and purpose is what gives our life meaning and purpose is what gives our life fulfillment. As we go into today's conversation, I want us to take three nuggets of wisdom. I talk about this in my books. I enjoy sharing uh, nuggets to take into the conversation as you already know, because it allows us to anchor our thinking and take perspective and show up in a mindful way. The first perspective I want us to take into the conversation is always connect with your being, 
to purposefully channel your doing because who you are is what's driving everything. What you do is informed by who you are. What you do should not change who you are. You have to remain authentic. And the lesson there for us is to remember self-mastery is the foundation for success. The second nugget of wisdom I want us to take into the conversation is everything you need to succeed in life is already inside you. Boldly draw from within because you are an embodiment of everything that the universe has to offer. So always remember to transform by drawing from within. And the third concept I want to take you into the conversation is life has to be lived as if the universe is rigged in your favor. What you believe will always become your destiny because the mind is a very, very powerful instrument. When you believe, you will achieve. And when you feel like you're stuck, take a step back and ask yourself, do you really believe or do you have self-doubts? And go and address your self-doubts and truly believe and the universe will enable you to accomplish what you want because your mind is what's driving your destiny. Your belief is driving your destiny. Today, to have a conversation on culturally intelligent and sustainable healthcare is Dr. Sivakumar Golasingam. Dr. Golasingam, welcome to the show. And go ahead. Hi, uh, good morning, Cass. Uh, and uh, thank you, the audience, for your valuable time. And uh, hope uh, I'll be able to share some uh, experiences with yourself. Beautiful. In the interest of self-disclosure, Dr. Golasingam is my brother. Yes, my blood brother. Somebody asked me, is he really your brother brother? Since you have so many brothers around the world, yes. Uh, Dr. Golasingam is my blood brother. He is one year younger than me. And growing up, we always joked about how I brought him into the world. And therefore, I am supposed to make sure all the fun I had, I included him in it. So we have a lot of childhood stories to share, but not for today. So as we get into the conversation, I want to give a brief introduction, just like I do for every one of my guests. Dr. Golasingham is an assistant professor and clinician teacher attached to the University of Toronto Department of Medicine, Division of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. He completed medical education at the University of Colombo, Sri Lanka, PMNR residency at University of Toronto, and a clinical fellowship in spinal cord injury and cardiac rehabilitation at University of Toronto and University of British Columbia. He is a staff a physiatrist at UHN's Toronto Rehab Lindhurst Center and Ramsey Cardiac Center. He is, his clinical work and research focus around SCI rehab, sports medicine, spasticity, sexual health, and wound care. His teaching activities stretch beyond medical undergraduates and postgraduates to include other healthcare professionals. He mentors residents and takes special interest in guiding international medical graduates. He is the residency program committee representative for spinal cord injury and cardiac rehab. He has been the PMNR division's examination lead and national examination lead for CAPMNR. He is also the national and international classifier for parasports. And as you can see on this map, born and raised in Sri Lanka, got his primary education in Sri Lanka, halfway across the world in the tropics, and then moved to Canada to practice his craft and serve his community. So Dr. Glessingham, as you come into this conversation, why don't you take a moment and share with us, what made you realize that healthcare is your passion? and rehab is your calling? Okay, that, that's a pretty broad question. And, and uh, when you talk about the choice of healthcare, I, I would uh, go back uh, down my memory lane. Um, we were brought up in a very religious background uh, family. Uh, and uh, we always, or our parents always believed uh, service to mankind is service to God. Uh, so from a younger age itself, we were inculcated with, with uh, 
concept of service. Uh, and I was able to do that through healthcare during the growing ages. Like I was part of different clubs where we did some health camps, uh, voluntary activities with uh, children with um, intellectually impaired and things like that. And that made me gravitate towards uh, more of healthcare caring industry. And then I think my mother was a great influence in making me choose uh, medicine as a field. Uh, Subspecializing in, in um, physical medicine and rehab or physiatry uh, was again um, by the different opportunities or exposures that I was uh, made into. Um, I initially wanted to work in the field of uh, psychiatry and when I was in one of the war zone areas when I was serving them, I did see the amount of, of uh, physical impairments that uh, the war had brought up. And then I thought, okay, I could do a little bit more than this. And that made me gravitate towards uh, physiatry or physical medicine and rehab. Uh, and then during my early years, uh, I had the opportunities of uh, involving with uh, sports and para sports, people with physically impaired. Uh, and that further consolidated my desire to serve this community, do things, and also establish my career pathway in the field of physiatry. Thank you. Thank you. That is a very, very insightful synopsis. And you had mentioned growing up in the middle of a war. So I want to touch on that. How did growing up in the middle of a war and serving the constituents who need a physiatry, spinal cord injury rehabilitation, and not only the war, you also did this profession in the middle of and after the tsunami. So Living in an environment where people are racially torn apart, but coming as a medical professional to serve everybody, you not only had to show up in our humanity to serve, but you also had the opportunity to bridge the divide. Talk about that experience and how that set the stage for you to then eventually migrate to the West and embrace a profession with humanity instead of putting people in boxes. So once again, uh, coming from the, the healthcare background, uh, we work in, in the capital. I mean, I'm, I'm married to, to be frank, uh, I need to disclose this as well. I'm married to a, a lovely physician, again, uh, from Sri Lanka, who is of a different language and religious background. So uh, I think uh, coming up or growing in a, in, in a country torn apart by different fractions and different uh, racial discussions, I think uh, sometimes you want to find a middle ground and that sometimes gravitate towards you doing certain things. Uh, and in, in my case, uh, although we, we, we experience firsthand of certain um, difficulties and challenges uh, while growing up, uh, we thought, or oh, it came to my mind, just like most others of, 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 of youth and young age, why can't I make a change? Why can't you be the change agent? Why, why can't you make the difference? Start from your end. So thinking about all these things and not having firsthand work in a really bad war zone area, uh, me and my wife opted to go and work in the middle of the war area where there was no physicians, no transport services, everything was through a convoy. So we go on the military convoy to the respective hospital, we stay there and, and serve. So working there, we did understand and realize the, the deficiencies, the inequalities, the resource deficiencies, accessibility concerns. This made me feel a little bit more than what I wanted to do. So initially I, I went there to do the psychiatry, as I mentioned. Uh, it saw a little bit more than psychiatry in, in my um, scope of practice. Uh, so that, gravitated me towards uh, doing a little bit more. And we did work, especially when you're working in, in a war zone area, you need to work with both sides. There, there are divides, there are, there are people who are being uh, impacted by the war, then there's the government, there is the military. So you need to work with all these different uh, organizations or, or communities or levels of governments and organizations to provide a holistic care for these individuals. And liaising and working with them, I did also realize that there is no good person, bad person. In every community, there is good and bad. 
and every level there is good and bad. And, and to be fact, like some of our activities or, or outreach activities were, were facilitated by some of the NGOs and even um, some of the military forces were behind us in helping in doing some of those activities like creating an occupational health unit, creating a recreational uh, place for patients who can do their activities. So this way I gravitated towards what we call uh, uh, community harmony or like working with different groups and collaborating with them. And finally, when I came to Kalam, uh, the Western province where I worked in, in the primary or national center for rehab, I, I was able to work very closely with both military as well as uh, the civilian groups. Um, so I think that exposure, especially working in the water zone area and uh, working in a resource constrained area where you have to invent or modify certain self, you have to be more pragmatic and practical. That are some of the hallmarks actually for, for rehabilitation medicine or psychiatry, where you work with individuals with difficult, different physical impairments. And all these experience actually, I would say enriched me for who I am. And, and for my chosen field. And finally, with regards to the, the move to the North America again, uh, as you said, I, I was born and uh, raised for almost four decades in Sri Lanka, but um, I, uh, I'm a Canadian by choice. Um, I, once I came here, it, it was a little bit difficult to get into integrated, but I think all the experience, the hardships, uh, and the life experience uh, really made you navigate through those um, challenges, I would say. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that journey with us. And as I hear you talk, the question that comes to my mind is when you're working in a war-torn poor country with resource constraints, you don't have all the equipment and bells and whistles that you get in a developed Western world and you have to improvise. And the devices and solutions provided to your patients has to be something that is culturally and is, uh, environmentally sustainable and culturally sensitive. So how did you develop that aspect of your physiatry? Because that is not part of what normally medical doctors in your field focus on, but you by necessity have had to take that on as well. So if you take a deeper dive into the concept of medicine or healthcare itself, they say it's just not science. It's an arts and science. Uh, medicine, it's an arts and science. So science is something that we learn through medical school, uh, but also there is an extension to the science, which are the social sciences. So you need to be cognizant. You have to be culturally aware. The more experiences that you have, you bring in a more holistic care for individuals. And then there's the second part, which is the art. And especially in our field, the physiatry or physical medicine, when you work with physically challenged people, a person with amputee, uh, an, an amputee in, in the West would be very different the way they manage and the way they manage in, in uh, Asia would be different. The way you manage in Nepal would be different. Just for an example, if I would say, uh, a person with a uh, double leg amputee, amputated both legs, maybe above the knee or below the knee, or an individual with spinal cord injury. In North America, they would, or even in the Europe, they would use a, a wheelchair, maybe a power wheelchair, maybe a motorized wheelchair, uh, a manual wheelchair, and they will get around. But if you think in a country like uh, Sri Lanka, India, where there are, I mean, restraints, cost restraints and financial restraints are there everywhere. But having a wheelchair of that nature may not that be feasible because the roads are not paved. It's not carpeted roads. You don't have good pavements to motorize your, I mean, move around with your wheelchair. Most of the terrains are uneven. So you cannot use a four wheeled wheelchair. So in, in, in the Asian region, we use a three wheeled wheelchair, which has a long arm and, and a caster wheel, which can navigate uneven terrain. This is why the tri or the tuk-tuks are more popular in the Asian uh, parts of the country, uh, world. So it's a similar concept for that wheelchair. But when we did some training in Nepal, it was a surprise. It was much more hilly um, environment. So you can't even maneuver a, a three-wheel wheelchair. So what they do is they use a wooden board with four caster wheels, and they propel themselves with two small uh, sticks. So you can see 
whatever you give as an answer or solution, especially with in, in medicine or people with physical impairment, it should be tailored based on where the person lives, what their needs are. Because end of the day, we talk about personalized healthcare. If you cannot deliver to their level and say, okay, no, this is a standard prescription. Here you are, you need a wheelchair, you use that. We saw this quite a lot during the tsunami when there was many international organizations who came in uh, to provide some services, right? So you can prescribe medications, you can prescribe services, but is that feasible? Is that conducible on the long run? Is it sustainable? Can it be replicated by the local community? What is going to be the cost or effects of replacing them, repairing them? So these are some of the things that has to be considered when you work with physical impairments. And for me, that has been one of the driving forces working in extremely two different parts of the world and also doing a lot of work in the Asia, including um, Thailand, Nepal, uh, India, and Cambodia has enriched me of different requirements and different cultural values of people. And that I would say helps me to divide or, or uh, deliver a much more, at least what I would consider a more closer to what they want from their end. And that is such an important statement you just made. Medical professionals understanding the socioeconomic conditions and lifestyle of their patients and the cultural nuances of their lifestyle and then delivering quality of life solutions for them to navigate their life instead of forcing them into living a life that we deem they should live. So to me, that is very insightful and that is what is in a large scale lacking in the Western world. So that brings up a question in my mind. It is not easy to get established and be successful as you were in one country, in one continent, and then make a complete shift to another Western developed country, especially in Canada, to then get recertified and truly recreate that same level of success or even surpass that. How did you navigate that? And what advice do you have for others who are trying to make that transition? To be uh, realistic, I mean, Canada is made out of many immigrants and I was just to review some of the statistics before we had the session today. Um, statistics based on 2016, we had 1.2 million immigrants coming between 2011 and 2016. So Canada is, is heavily dependent on immigrants and, and typically it's about 20% immigrants. Uh, and you see that even in the second generation. Um, for me, I had born and raised in, 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 um, in, in Sri Lanka or in the, in the East, which gave me almost three to four decades of life experience. Uh, fortunately, I was also uh, married and a father, so I probably, I believe that some of the skills of patience and uh, uh, trying to be uh, taking the different tones at different times also helped me probably. Uh, and again, uh, having a supportive spouse and family was also instrumental. Uh, transitioning in, into North America and, and continuing the same pathway, uh, I know uh, life is quite a bit of a challenge, especially when you have been brought up in, in, in a specific part of the world and you have to navigate so many obstacles, even to be heard. It's something like going from hero to zero overnight, right? We come, everyone comes with a lot of expectations and, and uh, wanting to contribute and uh, without being allowed to bring in their baggages, the, the, the potentials, the experiences, the contribution that they can make to the community, they are usually kept further apart. So I think that internalization part during the initial period is, is very important. And for me, some of the, the features or uh, facts that helped me was, uh, I would say, uh, I had a sound backing with my family. I had a very supportive uh, wife and children who were ready to take up anything that I wanted to. I had a supportive extended family that's, I mean, say my bigger family circle. My father was there with us at all times, and including my brothers and sisters, including my wife's parents. Uh, 
outside the supportive network because if you don't have an internal environment that is conducive when all these negative are thrusting you on on a day to day minute to minute basis you you tend to lose yourself and then comes to your immediate next circle where either your schooling circle your education circle the people that you are all meeting on a regular basis in order to advance your career so i did have a few um, really good uh, mentors uh, in the profession um, knowing that i was an uh, immigrant um, coming from a different part of the world some of them they they really saw some of my uh, achievements um, through different programs that i had and uh, with some of the books that i had shared with them and, and they were happy enough to offer me some of those uh, exposures so to have someone who can take you into their wings hand hold you and helping you that transition that is pretty important too i think that is one of the main thing that is uh, quite challenging when an immigrant comes because they need to work in two different environments they have their own cultural and the value system that they are bringing in maybe the system the way that they think for the healthcare or the profession or the family at the same time they need to uh, move into the new world that they are going to be internalized so having those few mentors who are great uh, in in providing you some of those insights into your profession um, actually helped then the other fact that i always looked for i i brought into my table again from the experiences that i worked in the water areas was that for you to be admired for you to be appreciated for you to be recognized you should probably think of doing for people who are really in hardships who are i would say within quotes below your level in the sense socio economically culturally physically or things like that so wherever you can go this is where the canada, canada is built big time on volunteerism so i just moved into doing some volunteer activities mainly to help people raise themselves up in whatever they are doing i initially volunteered in a school where my children were to go and fix some balls to the school chairs so that when they move the chairs in the classroom it doesn't creak and you cannot go into the classroom if you don't have a police report or a police clearance so when i went there to volunteer there were four people to i mean who who would name to volunteer but at the end of the day only i was there once i went in the security said oh you can't go inside because you don't have a police clearance so i said okay i just came to do this i don't need to be inside the classroom i just put the chairs out and i was just fixing the balls for the the tennis balls for the chairs principal walked by she just pulled the chair she sat next to me and she started talking to me and she realized my background and what things i had done and she said you need to come into the school council you need to compete for the school council chair election the coming month i said okay if you say so i'll do so i came in i come i i contested for the school council chair i became the school council chair and from there i also went into the inner city um council for a group of class for schools who are underprivileged or, or primarily immigrants similarly i did some classes for international medical graduates who were transitioning uh, into canadian healthcare system so when you do things to people who are also in the same boat or who are a little bit lower than you your appreciation uh, is there and that actually gives you uh, really a kick that your momentum and the way you feel that you are more positive and you have more positive energy and i think that also helped me to keep my momentum and positivity in spite of having all these challenges and thinking back oh i was like this i was like this i'm not able to achieve that so i was able to put that aside and see the positive side of it so these were some of the things that i really brought into my uh transition period and again i did whatever that i could do time spent with family and uh, times that i could make myself happy so those were the things that i did so all positive things uh, and try to keep away from the negative things for that two year period absolutely and that is such a important message to amplify you don't need to be the same person but you bring your personality in and create positive moments and then draw from those positive moments to keep moving forward i love i love how you just said that now it is not easy being a straddle generation because one leg is in your culture in your history in your roots 
and your other leg is planted to settle and grow roots in your new home. And children, on the other hand, generally are growing up in that new home. And I have seen too many straddle generation parents uh, rely on their children. In your case, you were both English proficient, you were both professional, so it was a little different. But what advice would you have for straddle generational parents who are not only allowing themselves to transition and settle while holding on to their culture, but passing on the culture to their children to appreciate their roots and know their identity? So they're grounded, but at the same time, letting them fly free so that they can find their place. That is not easy. I think you brought in a very important uh, point there or the concept. Uh, again, going back to statistics, uh, if, you, if you consider second generation uh, among the, the European descent, the second generation is about, based on the statistics, it's about 17 to 19%, whereas for Asian, South Asians, it's about 72%. So it is pretty important uh, how we position ourselves as parents, as first generation, uh, to navigate or to align the second generation. A true, uh, so one of the main challenges that the first generation or people who move in at a later age into any part of the world, especially to a, a newer home, uh, they will experience similar challenges. Uh, so I would say what I was able to, or what we, uh, me and my wife were able to bring in was to increase the value in us for the children, for the second generation to see what value you can bring in, in this community, this society, in the, this new world. So making them realize or appreciate the value that you can bring in makes them still give that respect keep you in, informed of every stage of their decision and action, and always feel free to have an open-minded discussion in, in navigating some of the challenges that they themselves face living between the two worlds. We do often see, even in, even in Toronto, even in Canada, the, the suicide rates uh, and the suicides among second generation uh, one of the reasons I would strongly believe it's, it's, it's the challenges the first generation is, is going through and how the, 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 the association between the first and generation, second generation is lacking in integrating. So again, going back to your question, uh, for us, what we tried to do was spend as much as more, as much time we can be together. So the initial two years, we would, I mean, both of us had to do different type of uh, part-time or, or jobs in order to uh, align ourselves into the career pathways. So one of us always took turns to be there with the children, to drop them to school, to pick them from school. When they came back from school, to do their homework. We always made it a point there was some physical activity so that they don't be bored. We had a park close by, so we spent some time in the park, either cycling or playing. So you did, these are things that you have done in the past, and you are definitely you're better than them on those aspects. You teach a child how to cycle, the child thinks, oh my God, my dad knows to do all these things, right? You, you kick a ball from the, the midpoint of the half line of the soccer grounds to the goal post, they say, wow, you're so strong, dad. So these are all things that small things that anybody can do, but your child would appreciate. And those memories stay in them for much more longer. And that's how they they the imagery they create about their parents. They know, oh, this person has these, these qualities. And then whenever we had a discussion, even when I had to apply for the different universities, even when we have to look for different housings with regards to, or moving to a different home in order to relocate ourselves, aligning with the schools and the university, we always took them into discussion. They need to feel the challenges that we are going through. We had a big map. We pointed out all the different schools. This is where our is going to work. This is where our mom is going to work. Or this is where dad is going to work. This is where your mom is going to work. And then this is where we are looking for schools. So they also get involved in the process. 
and then they feel inclusive and they feel that they are part of the decision making process and for us i think those smaller concepts and smaller deeds work a long way and that way like even when they had to go for a picnic school picnic one of us volunteer so it's not just looking after our own kid there was also contribution in looking after other kids so other children come and ask something from you so my children look up upon myself or my wife and say oh they all coming and asking me certain things from my parents so they must be knowing something so those smaller things build up over time and fortunately as you said like since we were english speaking we were able to help them in their education that was a that was a plus point uh, but we still learn from them with regards to technology and certain uh, uh, things which would be norms for uh, the generation growing here um, i think we learned a lot from my son rather than from my daughters uh, because thought daughters always took a different approach with the parents whereas my son because he is about 5 years different he would say no daddy this doesn't look cool right so then we just have to listen to him right so <laughs> i i would say having that relationship being as much as close to them and participating in different activities whenever you can i know that it is quite challenging as a as a newcomer you might have to struggle or shuttle between two different jobs your work and job so you may hardly find some time but even within that time try to do small things those do make a big difference very well said because children don't remember the title you had or the money you made but they will always remember the time you spent with them and the fact that you made them feel that they were a priority nothing is as important as that one last question before i open this up to the audience because i know the audience have questions and we have medical professionals and international immigrants here to ask you questions one last question is what advice would you have for young and old immigrants pursuing healthcare and why physiatry uh, sports medicine para sports speak to that okay so i would say like if if you are already been an as wherever you are you were a hero wherever you are you you have uh, devoted your time invested your time and education and all your endeavors to who you were before you move into this country you should still pursue your passion because you have identified sometime during a life that's what you are made up for you may take some deroots a failure is not the opposite of success it's just part of that journey to success so sometimes you have to take a deroot same thing which i did too for two years i i did completely different area than healthcare sector but at least i tried to work one day a week to align myself in order to have my resume and and my uh, contact with the healthcare in canada to keep uh, growing with the momentum and also to keep what is uh, the the newer trends so in in my case what we did was i i did participate between different activities which include some healthcare related activities but be routed myself in order to have the family have foot to mouth but later on i was able to navigate myself back into my area of speciality and even when you talk about healthcare you did mention about international educated professionals and coming into healthcare healthcare is a big industry it doesn't mean if you have been a physician you have to always be a physician there are plenty of physicians who are now got into research and they are the ones who are deciding how the research is progressing in in, in canada in our hospital the toronto rehab it's it's number 1 in rehab medicine in the world with regards to research the individuals who are leading the research teams are physicians in their previous practice so they bring into the table the experience and knowledge of a physician as well as that critical thinking and analysis process and then now they can tailor it based on what the needs are here in canada and what the patient population wants to similar with nursing similar with pharmacy there are ways that you can navigate yourself may not be with the direct pathway because there are certain professions which are regulated certain professions are very strictly regulated some are 
less strictly regulated, and there are non-regulated professions. So when you're coming into a regulated profession, there is going to be challenges, but you need to be uh, aligned with that. You need to better yourself. You need to work on improving yourself, not just getting through the exams, but also the soft skills. This is what we talk about internalization, right? Uh, so working with the people, understanding what the people needs are, what, what the needs of the hour with regards to healthcare, you may be able to navigate your pathways and, and whatever the area that you want to specialize in. And, and as I mentioned earlier, the healthcare is such a wide area in, in Canada, and you can get into any of those fields if you really have that passion. And then you can navigate yourself to become a leader, whether as a nurse, going into a nurse practitioner, a clinical nurse or a community nurse or a nurse practitioner leader. You can go into the pharmaceutical side. There are so many opportunities with regards to not even only the hospitals, but also in the industry, uh, pharmaceutical industry. Similarly with, with uh, the techni technology fields, technician fields like MLT and the, the others, there are still a lot of uh, openings. And, and in Canada, there is a big uh, need for healthcare based on the demographies and the aging population. And we saw that uh, firsthand during the COVID, not only in Canada, all over the world, healthcare is one of the bulletproof profession people would always need because there is nothing to overcome care needs at the most needed hour for people. So there are always opportunities, look for opportunities, don't get bogged down with only one uh, pathway have always a plan B. If plan A doesn't work, you should have a plan B. I always had a plan C in, in place. And the other thing I, I tell for newcomers is you need to do 300% to be C. Doing 100% may be okay if you're, uh, you're internalized, you have been born and bred in this country, you may have a last name that sounds that you're Canadian, but if, if it is any of those things are not there, you need to make yourself seen, heard, and visible. So you need to do better than what you normally would do. So you need to work on that, those principles and those soft skills in order for you to bring in. Uh, the other important thing that uh, newcomers, I would suggest that uh, would benefit is uh, the skills with regards to medical legal stuff. Uh, the ethical and medical legal items in, in North America is quite different from most countries that we come from. So being aware of what are the medical legal rights and ethical rights is, is pretty important and paramount. The other one, the primary thing is the email and internet and social media etiquettes. Uh, we, we tend to pass off everything that we get. We try to put in emails or, or write on emails some things which may not be eloquently or, or I would say properly crafted, which may come back to bite you. So, some of the things you need to be careful. Uh, so I would say the email etiquettes on social media etiquettes is important. Uh, the other thing I would say is learn to say no. I experienced this big time when I came to Canada because we come from a, a cultural background. Anybody ask you, yes, I'll do that. Yes, I'll do that. But once you say yes, and you have not fulfilled it, that becomes you have not achieved what you promised. So that becomes your incompetency. If you have too many workloads, if, if you have put your hands into too many things, someone is asking something else, you can say, at this point of time, I may not be able to commit because I have other commitments, but I'm more than happy to do that when the next opportunity comes. Please keep in mind. So those are important things because when it comes to keeping your word, keeping your milestones and keeping those commitments are important. So this is with regards to the newcomers, because I was in the same boat. I, I do advocate a lot for the newcomers. Uh, and those are some of the principles that I use. And with regards to people who like to get into physical medicine and sports medicine, for me, I think that is the pinnacle of uh, any health profession, I would say, because you work with people who are physically challenged. You try to put quality of life into individuals. And these people are not diseased or illness. It is a life-changing event and they have changed their life. Being a person who, was, who used to walk is now needing to use a wheelchair to move around, needing a prosthetic limb to walk. He may have been driving regularly, but now he needs modified hand control because his foot doesn't work. 
but he can still do things. He can enjoy sports the same way. If you see about the sports, the most toughest, fastest, deadliest game in the world, I would say, is wheelchair rugby. If you see the wheelchair rugby, people who are already spinal cord injury, you see the way that they bag the wheelchairs and they roll over and do all these crazy things in a small court without a helmet. They never talk about concussion, right? So bringing these people to do what they are best at, what they have inside them, I think it, it's, I'm fortunate to be part of that journey in bringing those individuals to that level. And also with regards to uh, physiatry, we touch on every area. We touch on pain, we touch on musculoskeletal medicine, we touch on urology, bowel management, cardiology for cardiac rehab. We work with pediatric population, we work, work with adolescents, we work with geriatric population. So you, you get a satisfaction of, of seeing and contributing to different uh, people and different uh, individuals in, in life. And then if you want, you can, you, you can move your niche based on which area you want to subspecialize in. So for me, it's really fulfilling and it's really gratifying to see working with these people and trying to bring them to what they were or aiming at and also bringing them back into the community to become productive citizens, productive to the society and contributing in a positive way. So bringing them there is gratifying for me. Thank you, thank you. And that was a very powerful way to not only answer that question, but end your thought process. And I am going to open it up. And Dr. Bowie, you're the medical doctor in the room and I know you have a question, so go ahead. Well, thank you. Good morning. Uh, appreciate your time, uh, Dr. Uh, Singh again. Uh, appreciate it. it was enjoyable to listen to your talk. Um, it's more, I think the, a lot of things that you said uh, was very impactful. I think um, w one of them is one of the touch on was uh, personalized medicine. I think that today the way medicine in the U.S. is, is it's not really personalized. Um, that comes into the conflict because I think um, medicine today is moving and transitioning more towards um, what I call kind of like mass production. So it's uh, it really comes into conflict when we want to provide personal care because um, we want to improve efficiency. Um, it's more towards gears towards volume. So as a result of that, um, to kind of like do that personalized medicine, it is very difficult in the U.S. how it's structured and with time constraints. So you want to kind of just keep, you know, the flow, it's like a factory of work and you want to just shove patients in and let, get them out of the system. So that, like I said, it really comes into the conflict with personalized medicine, I think, and providing that with more of a cookie cutter where everybody comes in, get the same service and in and out, in and out. So that really, that really is, is very problematic today. And the second thing that you said was very, um, um, and the way your work is that resonate well was about the physicians. Oftentimes, I think we lead through position of, of leadership, power leadership or positional leadership instead of influence. And the things that you have shown is actually you can go outside of being a doctor and use the power of influence to kind of really make a difference in other areas. And, and I think that, that I think today, I think is still lacking in the medical community is that we, we have a tendency as physicians to use uh, physician uh, leadership and not influential leadership. And so I think we, we do have a huge opportunity to kind of like pivot towards influential leadership and to be the key drivers in how healthcare is delivered today but with the power of influential leadership and not through position we can't use our MD and everything else to influ uh, to kind of exert that influence we want, but we need to like understand the power of influence uh, much better. So I really appreciate your talk today. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, I, I do uh, endorse some of the things. I think some of the discrepancies or, or challenges uh, different from US and Canada or North and South is partly because of the way the healthcare system is developed, right? So uh, the Canadian model is much more holistic one in the sense it's uh, it's it's a public funded system whereas in, in north in us you will have to be somewhat uh, controlled or manipulated by the insurances and the healthcare 
uh, other domains. Uh, but again, I mean, the, one of the reasons that I went into para sports and sports medicine was also because I thought that I wanted to get away from the traditional medicine stuff alone, just seeing the people and treating, but just doing a little bit extra that will also give me some happiness. So that's why I gravitate towards the para sports. Uh, and, and as you mentioned about uh, being an influence, a factor of influence or a change agent, for me, again, I, I didn't get this opportunity to mention that some of the influencers, because at different uh, time of life, there are different influences. One of the key influencers for me in, in rehab medicine was an eight-year-old boy whom I saw as my first spinal cord patient in Sri Lanka. He didn't have parents. His uh, Mother passed away a long time back due to war. Father went into sea and he was a fisherman. He, he never came back. So he was growing up with his brother and he went to pluck, pick some coconuts and a coconut fell on his nape of the neck. He became paralyzed. He was a spinal cord injury guy. Ask questions every day he has a question. He was eight year old. And by the time, in, in two years time, he learned to use his mouth to hold a pen and write. And he was the first person that we got a power wheelchair for our institution with a German um, donor. And he finally became a, a patient, uh, um, what you call patient coordinator. And he is the one who navigates the patient flow in the hospital. And we were managed to get uh, the Ministry of Health to employ him and keep him there permanent because normally health institutions don't keep anybody in person. So sometimes I know that we think that we are an influence, but we have also been influenced by people whom we really treat and care. So as you said, yes, identifying those influencers and putting that into place definitely makes a big change. Thank you. Thank you for that powerful story. And thank you for that question. Yes, Wolfgang, go ahead. Well, first of all, good morning, Dr. Gulasin Gam. I hope I'm soon staying it correctly. <laughs> it's such a pleasure to meet you, especially because I think I, I met my brother, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Cass and I talk about um, me, me being her, her other brother, and I can see why, because uh, we do have a lot of things in common. So I do appreciate your discussion and the things that you have done. Uh, particularly, um, I think, uh, and I'm not in the medical profession by any means, so, so I'm not going to speak for that, but more about the example that you gave is really a great example of faith in action. You know, you got there, you didn't know anything, but you, you had other skills and you put them to work, and you put them to work for the good of the or for the greater good. And I am a big believer that good things beget good things. And I think that's one of the reasons that you probably have, are blessed where you are right now and are be able to accomplish the things uh, that you have accomplished. So um, I don't really have a specific question. I just want to make that comment because it is uh, it is very good to see other immigrants. Like I'm an immigrant from Latin America into the United States. Uh, and uh, we had to go through all the different things that many immigrants go through. Uh, but I'm really, uh, I, I wish the U.S. would treat its immigrants uh, similar to what Canada does in many ways, you know, more more of a curtake bringing in. Um, I have, I was once in Canada for Canada Day, I think that's July 1st. We were there with my wife and, and daughter and we were going to uh, the celebration, which was going to be big fireworks. And one thing that just struck me that day is the thousands of people going towards the celebration holding Canadian flags were immigrants from Sri Lanka, from India, from Pakistan, from other places. And I was like, that did good to my heart to see that. So anyway, pleasure to meet you. I hope someday we'll get to meet you in person and uh, look forward to that, sir. Thank you. Just to add to your comment, uh, as you mentioned, when you're transitioning as, as an immigrant in a new country, it's not only the profession or the passion you have, it's also important to bring our transferable skills, just as you mentioned. So transferable skills is important. Sometimes we don't know what transferable skills are when you come to a country, because that's not a term inology that we have been aware of. So there are certain workshops or, or even tools that you can identify your transferable skills and identify what you are good at, and then gravitate towards those things, at least as a transient, till you come into your mainstream. So the, the, the social etiquette is, is one, and then the transferable skills is another important big chunk that you would uh, bring with you or identify in order for you to have a successful transition. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you Wolfgang. And thank you, Dr. Glissingham. One last comment or question. One minute. Go ahead. Floor is open. 
Anybody of the audience? Lisa Marquis. Otherwise, what I'm going to do is, uh, Siva, as, oh, go ahead, Marquis. I'm in the car, so my apologies. Uh, but doctor, it's a pleasure to meet you. And, and Cash, you're making me jealous because I thought I was a brother. And so now <laughs> we have this whole family. <laughs> no, really. Um, thank you so much for sharing about transferring. Because it's in my vision to be an immigrant somewhere at some point in my next five years. And so being aware of the importance of what I bring to that community and being able to connect with that as well as the impact it'll have on my children was very helpful today. So I appreciate that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Marquez. I have brothers from all over the world and that's what makes my life. <laughs> so Wolfgang I'm glad and to be one. Thank you so much for showing up to support my blood brother. I, I thought it was funny when you asked, is he really your brother brother? So yes, yeah. this is my brother brother and all my brothers in appearance <laughs> here. And I am the luckiest gal today. And as we bring this to a close, Siva, Take 30 seconds. What piece of advice do you have for anybody who is seeking to live a fulfilling life? Do what you are best at. Do not compare with others. Set a standard to better your best. This is again a concept that I learned from one of the Para Sports coaches, one of the top coaches in Canada, is better your best. That should be your goal. So you would make progress every day. That is actually a wonderful place to bring this amazing conversation to an end. Because remember, you are only competing with yourself and your goal should be being better today than you were yesterday. You're only progressing against your own yesterday self. And as the conversation has informed us today, we grow and we transform and we succeed because of the circle we create and the human lives we touch. So as we always remind on the show, go on and start making your human connections, keeping in mind every human interaction is your opportunity for transformation. So we'll go out there, transform lives, and in the process, don't forget to transform your own. You can catch our episodes and programs on YouTube channel at Transform with Dr. Cass. And we look forward to seeing you at our next episode. And Dr. Kalusingham, thank you so much for sharing your insights. We wish you the very best. You've been nominated for a uh, immigration award, an immigrant award. We are all voting for you. We are cheering you on and we cannot wait to see you as a winner. And we wish you the best. And we look forward to seeing all the contributions you're going to make to humanity. Thank you for having me. And thank you for the wonderful audience for your time. Thank you.